thank you very much for the introduction and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with you all this uh, afternoon. It's, uh, it's difficult after speaking after lunch because it's uh, always a sleepy time so I'll try to keep it lightly. Uh, it, uh, I want to thank uh, PIDS for inviting me to uh, this conference to hear from the speakers but also to learn from your experience uh, in the area of uh, workforce development. Let me just give you a quick introduction to uh, my organization. Can we bring the slides up? So I, I come from an, uh, an organization that's called Skills Future Singapore. We are a government agency that looks at setting the policies as well as providing the funding for upskilling and reskilling of the workforce. And we report to the Ministry of Education. Just two years ago, in 2016, we restructured the Workforce Learn Agency into two separate entities, one of which was uh, is Space Future Singapore, and the other one is Workforce Singapore that looks at helping displaced workers find jobs. So my role within the uh, organization is to manage all our training partners, uh, including the private training providers, the Institutes for Higher Learning, which uh, encompasses the polytechnics, the universities, as well as our, our techni technical education institution. Uh, and today I'll share with you some of the efforts and initiatives that we have taken to uh, respond to the disruptions that we're seeing in the workplace. So many of the speakers this morning, uh, they've already touched on characteristics of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and I think there's three major characteristics of the fourth industrial revolution that sets it apart from previous industrial revolutions. One of which is the speed of the revolution. Past industrial revolutions have has taken hundreds of years uh, to move from one stage to another. Between the third and the fourth industrial revolution, the span of the time is only about 30 years. And if this speed continues, then we'll see the next revolution in maybe 15 years, 10 years, and it'll keep shortening. So the speed at which the revolution is hitting us is unprecedented. The other characteristic is the scope of the um, scope of the uh, revolution. Just maybe 10, 20 years ago, if you think about ICT, Infocom technology, yes, it's something that we're aware of, we need to train our people in, but I think the general perception is that the impact will be limited to a few industry sectors. But what we have seen today, and what is uh, evidence from the presentations this morning, is that the impact is going to be widespread. For one, uh, I was surprised when I saw Stephen's uh, <coughs> diagram on digital technologies in agriculture. So as you know, Singapore doesn't really have an agricultural sector, so I'm not as well versed in that. But you know, sensorized cows and uh, you know, like automated uh, tractors. So it's true, even in agriculture, it's being displaced. Now, some other industries that we don't typically think about uh, in, in disruptions, the legal sector is being disrupted as well. You don't need legal assistance to go through pages and pages of case uh, files to find uh, what you're looking for. You know, that can be automated. Uh, accountants, um, you know, in that accounting industry is facing uh, challenges as well. Financial advisors, so even industries like finance, accounting, legal, even those in sectors are being impacted. So here are some reports from various think tanks, various uh, um, companies, uh, various uh, policy uh, makers around the world. Uh, so I think McKinsey had published a report uh, some last year, two years ago, something like 14% uh, of the global workforce, or some, uh, translated to 375 million workers, would be displaced in the, in the years to come. Uh, in that same report, uh, there are projections that 65% of what students are learning today in school is going to be obsolete and irrelevant by the time they get to the workforce. Right, so one third or more of the des desired skill sets, uh, this is according to, the, to Deloitte, um, you know, will be comprised of skills that are not seen today. And that's going to hit us quite soon, in two years' time. The shelf life of skills is reducing rapidly. 
So if you are a graduate in ICT, if you are out of school and looking for a job, within about six months, you need to reskill yourself again if you want one of some of the uh, leading edge jobs. So shelf life is uh, reducing, and by projections, if we have a 30 year career, your, your children, my children, when they hit the workforce, they will need to think about switching or upskilling themselves and, and maybe switching jobs six times throughout their uh, 30 year career. So that's quite different from a paradigm today. Today our model is we educate our students, we send them out to the workforce and somehow magically they will stay relevant to the workforce. That's being challenged by disruptions uh, that we're seeing today. So that brings an important question to us, uh, to all of us in this room, whether you are an academic, whether you are a policymaker, whether you are somebody from the industry. The paradigm of education is shifting. It's shifting from one that is front-loaded, where you know, we educate our students through our formal system for 12, 13 years, sending them out. Uh, that paradigm is shifting. We need a system that's a lot more responsive, a lot more agile, that would transform itself along with the disruptions that are coming. And the difficulty that we face is we're not well equipped to deal with that. Our formal education systems are very structured and has worked well for us for many, many years. I would say that if you are, if you are an academic or an administrator in the university, thinking about how to shift your organization, that just seems quite impossible. The structures are so entrenched uh, in, and um, uh, it's hard to change. Uh, um, for practices that have been around for such a long time. Now, so in the Singapore context, we've thought about how we're going to bring about this, uh, this change into a system that's a lot more agile, a lot more responsive. There are four main shifts that we are working on. Uh, and part of this, uh, implementing these shifts uh, is, is um, a part of the restructuring of the Workforce Development Agency and formation of my agency is to address some of these uh, shifts that I'm talking about. First is we need to rebalance academic and vocational pathways. In many Asian countries, including Singapore, parents, students aspire towards university degrees. I think that happens here in the Philippines too, right? Most students would be like, go to get a university degree. Not only that, uh, become a lawyer, or engineer, or a doctor, right? Um, so that, that mindset, I think, is quite prevalent in Asia. Uh, and so many students are actively pursuing degrees, even if they're not interested in the area, you know, they're trying to go for the degree, or if, even if there are vocational pathways that are better suited for what the, the talents and skills are, this preoccupation with um, academic qualifications, I think that needs to come to a better balance point. Skills are becoming increasingly important. Uh, in our engagements with companies, especially leading uh, global MNCs, uh, as, uh, uh, in particular, technology companies, the hiring po strategy has changed. Uh, it's no longer just about the qualifications. Uh, the qualifications, academic qualifications, is a proxy for what your intellectual capability is. But what the employers need today are the skills. The individual has to come into the job, have the skills, and be able to deliver. Right? So we're seeing increasing, um, uh, increasing trend in employers choosing skills uh, in addition to looking at academic qualifications. Uh, you must be familiar with a company Accenture. So Accenture has a large operations in Singapore and uh, they have made a big move towards hiring for skills um, and not just uh, uh, degree uh, qualifications. So we need to rebalance academic with vocational uh, qualifications and we're making a push uh, in that area. The second shift is to rebalance learning in school and learning at the workplace. So a traditional model of classroom-based delivery of institutional-based learning has to be augmented with uh, industry workplace-based learning. Uh, in this area, we've launched a range of programs, uh, f for example, like enhanced internships, earn and learn programs, uh, work learn programs, which infuses elements of industry knowledge, industry context, within the education journey. A third shift 
that I've touched on earlier is to rebalance between front-loading education and what we'll call lifelong learning. Right? In the model that I just talked about, if we had a shelf life of five years for skills and we have to reskill ourselves six times within our career, the model of front-loading all, uh, um, all that students have to learn you know, within the first 12, 13 years of their life, that's not gonna work anymore. We need to make available training opportunities, education opportunities throughout their lives and change uh, the education, education paradigm to much more of uh, one that's lifelong learning based. The final shift, which I think is not new to um, educators around, um, around the room and certainly uh, that's been a focus for us for some time, uh, but I think it's also important to recognize that while we're training for skills, skills are not just technical base. Uh, as our students, as our workforce navigates new uncertainties, new dynamics, new disruptions, they need to have what we call transversal skills, soft skills that it, are able to help them uh, to be able to cope with challenges. And these soft skills include mindset uh, interventions. How do they embrace innovation, in, embrace change, and to accept that uh, they have to keep running, they have to keep upskilling if they want to stay employable. So in 2015, uh, the Singapore government launched an ambitious initiative, we call it the Skills Future Movement. And it's called a movement, it's not called a program, it's not called initiative, because the way we see it is, it's indeed a movement. It's gonna be multi-year, it's gonna take, it's gonna be sustained over a period of time, uh, and it's gonna try to move the nation uh, to a mindset of uh, lifelong learning. Now we have provided workforce training support for many years, uh, and for at least uh, 15, 20 years, but SkillsFuture signals quite a major shift. And I'll say underlying the SkillsFuture movement is a shift of mindsets. Mindsets of individuals, mindsets of companies. And I'll talk more about that later on, uh, but I think that's critically important that individuals, workers, companies, employers, need to embrace this notion of lifelong learning. So the SkillsFuture movement is uh, underpinned by four tenets, which is listed on the, uh, on the slide. Uh, but I'll just highlight a couple of things. With the SkillsFuture movement, we are looking to empower individuals, but to also inculcate a mindset amongst individuals that learning for life is their responsibility. That they have to take charge of it. It's not the employer's responsibility alone, it's not the education system alone, but individuals have to keep upskilling and reskilling themselves uh, to stay employable. And that has to be done through offering an integrated system, an integrated education and training system. Part of restructuring the workforce development agency and having my agency reporting into the Ministry of Education is to foster that integration. In the past, we think about the formal education system as being separate from the continuing education system. Uh, we call the first 12 years of uh, education, 12, 16 years of education, uh, we, we term it as pre-employment training, PET. And then continuing education, we term it as CET. We used to approach those two domains as quite separate. Increasingly, we're looking at it as a much more integrated uh, pathway. And for individuals, no matter where your starting point is, no matter where your pausing point is, you have, to, you have to be able to keep coming back in the system uh, for further upgrading and reskilling. So that integrated system is quite important. And uh, I also talked about employer's mindset. So the essential example that I gave is one example of how an employer has started embracing uh, recognition of skills at the workplace for recruitment and for promotion. And that would ultimately help to foster a culture of lifelong learning amongst the, the nation. In the next few slides, I'll share with you a few examples of specific initiatives that we have to benefit individuals, to benefit employers, and also to uh, benefit training providers, training institutions. So for individuals, we have uh, a curated set of training that's listed on a national portal. We call it My Skills Future. 
and individuals can go to this portal, set up their own skills profile and a past training record, and be able to receive recommendations and also be able to search a training database uh, that has about 24,000 courses listed on it in various industry areas. And so if you go to the myskillsfuture.sg site and you type in data analytics, you'll get a whole list of courses. You type um, uh, welding or forklift operations, you'll see a list of courses as well. So these are vocational skills, as well as other skills like leadership and people management, you see a list of courses. So making these training courses easily accessible. Uh, and these training courses are de uh, de developed and delivered by a range of uh, providers across the um, education landscape. In addition to that, we have also given every eligible Singaporean $500 in training credits, uh, and they can use this to offset learning that they choose to embark on. Uh, let me also mention that for most of the training that are work skills related, uh, we provide training subsidies ranging from 50% to 70% of course fees. Uh, and in some cases for low wage workers or for mature workers who are out of jobs, uh, that subsidy level goes up to 90%. So that's uh, quite a lot of funding for, for education and training uh, of our workforce. Specific to Industry 4.0 and the uh, digital disruptions, we've also launched a national program to um, equip all individuals with a mindset of what are some of the new things that are coming up, uh, some concepts around working with data, some concepts around innovation, uh, and we call that the uh, Skills Future for Digital Workplace program. And this is a, you, you can think about this as an introductory program uh, to uh, digital disruptions at the workplace. And this is being rolled out to uh, uh, the entire workforce. We've also curated eight emerging skills areas, including data analytics, cybersecurity, automation, and these are courses, these are a range of uh, specific courses for employers and individuals who want to pursue further knowledge and skills in, uh, in these different areas. And these are mostly delivered by our universities and polytechnics who, ha who have uh, taken their academic knowledge and repackaged it into formats that are suitable for the workforce. So bite-sized modular training uh, for the workforce in these emerging skills areas. Uh, for the employers, uh, we recognize employers who are progressive in their workplace uh, learning and, and training practices. Uh, we have an award that's handed out by our president every year uh, to recognize uh, employers who are, who are um, leading in this space. This is part of, again, driving that awareness and that recognition for embracing of skills and uh, continuing uh, continue education. Uh, on the right-hand side, I, I just want to talk about an initiative that we have taken uh, that we started uh, a few years ago, which is to map out skills frameworks for 34 different industries. So in the different industry areas, we work with, in, we work with companies to map out what are job families in each of these sectors, and in each job family, what are the kind of job roles uh, across from entry level to the top person, and then for each job role, to then define what are the technical skills that are needed, and the uh, transversal skills, the soft skills that are needed. And this then becomes part of a blueprint, a map for training provision, for uh, recruitment, for job descriptions. Uh, you can access these on our website. Uh, they're made available publicly. Uh, so that's part of uh, our efforts to keep pace with what are some of the skills needs and the skills forecasting uh, that's, that's uh, required by the industry. On the uh, education and training provider front, as I mentioned, we work with all the uh, polytechnics, the universities. We have managed to, uh, we manage a block funding to these institutions for the provision of continuing education offerings, uh, including the cost fee grants that I talked about. Uh, and traditionally, we've been working with the private training providers. Uh, and in some areas that are of high importance, we establish what we call CET centers, where these training providers will not only provide training, but we'll work with companies to drive transformation uh, in those particular sectors. So for example, retail. Retail is being um, disrupted by e-commerce, by digital marketing. Uh, our um, Institute for Retail uh, Studies works with companies to look at not just training, but also how to uh, transform 
retail companies into um, um, dual supply chain companies, uh, uh, the online offline integration uh, in those companies. I'll end with a few examples of companies that have uh, embraced uh, different skills future initiatives. This company is a local small medium enterprise, Shalom Movers. They help with uh, relocation services, mostly domestic. Uh, and as you can imagine, these are low-skill jobs and typically uh, not very popular with, uh, with the workforce. But with their emphasis on lifelong learning and uh, continuing upgrading of their workforce, they've actually managed to uh, increase um, loyalty, uh, employee loyalty to the company because these employees see a career progression for themselves and they have embarked on a range of different initiatives to support their employees. Larger companies like Stanchart uh, have uh, been very supportive of the SkillsFuture efforts. They have uh, forked out some of their own budgets to augment the government funding uh, to ensure that their workforce remains employable and upskilled. Every year we award individuals who are outstanding examples of lifelong learning and so here are just three examples. Uh, this gentleman here runs a Chinese medicinal shop. Uh, this lady here is a kindergarten teach, uh, principal. Um, this gentleman here is a shoemaker. So you could celebrate skills in every industry, not just your, you know, those that are held in high esteem professionally, but in every single industry, you can encourage the uh, individuals to uh, aim for skills mastery and become master craftsmen in their, in their own areas. So I think the final, let me just uh, conclude uh, by saying that although the government has put a lot of initiatives in place and is very supportive of lifelong learning, it can only work if we have everyone on board, the individuals, the employers, uh, and with appropriate government support, that could work. Because we're talking about moving an entire system uh, and underlying all this is a change in mindset and to embrace lifelong learning as a way of life. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Elizabeth King. Thank you very much. Um, is this working? Okay. Thank you to PIDS for the invitation. I'm very excited to talk to uh, talk about uh, a research that I think is quite related to this topic, but it's a little different from, let's say, Mike, what Michael had, has talked about, which is very specific to the kinds of interventions and programs that Singapore is doing to, um, to augment skills. So let me, let me bring you to back to this one question that was mentioned earlier, which is, where, what are the kinds of skills that workers need to be able to deal with disruptive technologies or disruptive um, systems, right? Assist, uh, disruptive innovations. That's really, it's really about those skills that, that students need. And are we preparing uh, students for the workforce? And, and, and do they have those kinds of skills? Instead of uh, focusing on only one country, I want to tell you a little bit about this research on nine countries, nine middle income countries. Um, in, in theory, the Philippines could have been uh, one of 10 countries, but uh, the survey in the Philippines actually used a different uh, instru survey instrument, so there was no, we were trying to harmonize this uh, study for, uh, of middle income countries. So it's nine countries. Uh, four countries are in the post socialist, are post socialist or transition countries. Then there are two countries in Latin America, Bolivia and Colombia, uh, 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 two countries in. Um, Eastern, uh, let me see what else are there. And I just, oh, then we have uh, Ghana and Kenya. And so there are nine countries altogether, just one missing there, Vietnam. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about what this is, which is, uh, let me take this uh, microphone so I can see the slides too. Thank you. Thanks very much. So the challenge for schools, therefore, just continuing on that line of thought, is how to transmit new knowledge, but also how to build new skills. 
and most of all, how to engender innovativeness, flexibility, and adaptability, because that's exactly what we need to have in, among students to be able to use disruptive technologies. Otherwise, higher unemployment, slower growth, these are some of the impacts of not being able to uh, adapt to the changing technology and the changes in the composition of jobs in the economy. So these are some of the questions that, that we look at. And let me tell you a little bit about um, uh, what we use to, uh, to look at these questions. So we look at the relationships between schooling and what Michael was calling soft skills, but also called non-cognitive skills by economists, called psychosocial skills or 21st century skills or uh, socio-emotional and personality uh, skills. And in economics, most of the time, when we look at, uh, try to explain the differences in, in, in earnings of individuals, of workers, we look at their, what, what are the qualifications they bring to, the, to their jobs. And usually that's measured as the number of years of schooling. Uh, more and more, we're looking also at how, how well uh, workers have have uh, do with respect to cognitive skills, as in literacy, numeracy, uh, science uh, knowledge. Our study differs in that we actually have measures of these soft skills. So the, the purpose of the study is to see to what extent the kinds of returns, what, to, to what extent the ret our former measures of the returns to education changes as we bring in measures of actual skills learned, in this case the cognitive skills, uh, in this case uh, measured as literacy, but, but much more than just whether, you know, much more than reading. It's really about how well do um, the workers uh, manage uh, textual, textual uh, knowledge or textual information. And then uh, several measures, 10 in fact, of personality, soft skills, non-cognitive skills. And uh, here we also look at um, the, the differences in earnings for men and women to see to what extent those kinds of skills, the, non, the soft skills, differ between men and women. And you'll sort of be surprised that there are in fact differences. And to what extent those skills are rewarded in the labor market. So these are just some of the, let me turn your attention mainly to this bottom side, which is that we look at the earnings distribution. That means to say we look at low earners versus high earners, because we want to know to what extent Cognitive and, and soft skills are rewarded. Are they, are soft skills or cognitive skills more rewarded at the lower part of the earnings distribution or at the higher part of the earnings distribution? And um, again, I mentioned to you what were the uh, uh, countries that we look at. There were, this survey uh, included 3,000 households per country. We look only at ages 25 to 54, so the sort of the prime uh, working ages. And these are some of the other measure, other variables that we, or factors that we control for. So over time, the world and, many, and the countries that we look at have been very successful with respect to increasing uh, educate, years of education. And this is just to, to, to look at these uh, gender differences. So a country like Colombia, for example, has been basically able to erase the gender difference in years of, uh, years of education as measured by years of schooling. Whereas in Ghana and Kenya, as, as years of schooling have been going up, it's always the boys who go first and then the girls follow later. And that's why you see this increase in uh, the gender difference in schooling years. So we'll look at how do these, how are these differences reflected in the labor market. So, so what's in a name? It's very 
simple. We sometimes call these soft skills, personality skills. So uh, psychologists call it uh, psychosocial, social-emotional. Economists use the term non-cognitive skills for these kinds of things. And what are these? These are using what um, the five-factor model that uh, psychologists use, which is which has several um, soft skills uh, components. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, emotional stability, or neuroticism. And then you have grit, decision making, hostile attribution bias, and so forth. I'm sure that w whether any of you is a psychologist or not, you've heard about some of these. So these are the kinds of measures that we have for every single individual in our survey. And we then try to see what, to what extent and which of these things come out as significant for earnings. So as it turns out, so what we do is um, we, we look at differences between men and women. And here's just, let's start with the cognitive skills, which is the literacy proficiency. Again, this is more than just reading. It's about being able to work with, context, with, with contextual, with textual information. And what we find is that um, the former Soviet, not just Soviet, but the former socialist countries, actually the women do pretty well relative to the men. And, with respect, and then uh, in the case of the other countries, it's the men who do better with respect to these kinds of skills. And then with respect to the soft skills, again, just, just comparing uh, men and women, you see that there are, in fact, quite important differences. Take a look at emotional stability. In no country are women, do they test better than men with respect to emotional stability. And these are tests, we didn't come up with a test. These were uh, uh, psychologists have come up with a test, and that is quite interesting, isn't it? And then when you take a look at um, decision making as well, you have some countries that are where the women are thought to be, or they think that they are better at decision making, or they, they seem to be better at decision making. And risk taking is the other one that's interesting. In no country do women score better with respect to risk taking? I wish I'd remembered about the Philippines because the Philippines was actually a little different and that the women were showing up to be uh, more risk takers. So it's, we, we tend, you know, we, we, t we think we know how men and women differ. It's interesting to see that they actually test differently. And that these have repercussions on how much men and women earn. So that's just emotional stability and then the risk taking. Those are two that I wanted to bring your attention to. And this is just a, a, a summary of those. So now do, they, do these matter for the earnings of men and women? And do they matter in the same way? First of all, in terms of years of schooling, all right, Every year of schooling doesn't pay in the same way. And as technologies improve and become much more digitized, more, the, tech, the, the disruptive technology happens, there's a bigger payoff more and more to finishing secondary school and going to post-secondary school. So one more year of education is not the same as at the lower grades as it is for the higher grades. There is much more a much higher return to more than 13 years of schooling. And, in fact, for women, it is more important. And I think the story behind that, when I was looking at this result, is that women have to, well, first of all, uh, women have, to, in general, have to signal harder. And schooling, years of schooling, is actually a, a stronger signal to employers than any of the other skills. So this is just looking at the human capital as a whole. The green, 
part of the bar is the returns to years of schooling. And then the orange part of the bar up at the top is the return to personality skills or the soft skills. So altogether, these skills matter. So it's not just sort of the front-loaded uh, human capital that matters. I think what we're seeing here also, the fact that you have uh, the soft skills or non-cognitive skills, but also whether they test, because these are adults, right? Whether they test with, well with respect to literacy assessment is telling us also about whether uh, workers are able to retain the kinds of cognitive skills that they, that they absorb or that they learn. So when we, when we include these other skills in the, in the earnings function, the, the gap that we see between men and women narrow from 31% to 28%. So it takes, even though I said that years of schooling is very important for our women, women have to demonstrate that they have better um, non-cognitive skills than men to be able to reduce that, the uh, gender gap in earnings. So here, based on the, this quantile regressions in, in which we look at the full earnings distribution comparing low earners with high earners, we find that the return to cognitive skills is weakly significant, only weakly significant for women, for men across the, uh, in the countries, but it's, very, it's strongly significant for women in particular at the lower and the middle part of the earnings distribution. Our interpretation of, that, of, the, of the result is that investments in quality, in the quality of schooling that improve learning count more for girls. So again, the, the, the signaling part is very important for girls. Ed, well, signaling part on the years of schooling, but also they have to signal more and test better. And then they get higher earnings. So what we find when we start looking at the individual soft skills is that openness to new experience, which I think is openness, let's say, to disrupt, disruptive in, uh, innovation and risk taking um, has a high return and it's larger for men. Hostile attribution bias means it's, it's, it's about the locus of control. So when uh, when people think that it's somebody else's fault, so whatever happens to them, it's not their fault, it's somebody else's fault. When people test more negative for that, that means they have higher hostile attribution bias, they earn lower. So it's really people who, who, who tend to feel and act like they have more control over their lives who actually earn uh, more. And it's... Uh, strongly significant for, for men. So for men, they should feel like they're in control more, and that's how they earn uh, more. Extroversion, conscientiousness, emotional stability, not significant for men, significant and positive for women. Risk-taking uh, increases the probability of being in paid work for, for women, not really significant for men. Agreeableness is not good for men, better for women. So it's interesting that there are differences across the countries, that, but one begins to see some patterns in, in this. And then finally, on this one, what we did was we decomposed. By that, we mean to say we looked at the gender gap and we wanted to see how much of the gender gap is due to differences in human capital or years of, of schooling or differences in cognitive skills or differences in the soft skills. Or how much of that is really because these skills are being rewarded differently for men and women. And what we find, actually, is that 
relative. So one is called the coefficients gap versus the uh, covariance gap versus the coefficients gap. I'm sorry about the technical la language. All it means is whether it's human capital levels or the rewards to human capital. And what we find still is that at the end of the day, it's really how the labor market uh, rewards these skills that matters most for, um, for the gender gap in earnings. And that um, especially in the non f in the uh, the the non form the non former socialist countries, what we see is a sticky floor, meaning to say that in fact there are um, we cannot get the the gender gap lower uh, with both with either. Uh, with, with human capital, uh, but that uh, it's more important than, having, than the glass ceiling. The glass ceiling means to say, probably because human capital is not so high yet in some of these countries, so we're not hit, hitting the ceiling. So I think, and I realize there's a lot of text to read, so I, I'm giving you a little bit of a chance to, to look at this. But I think at the end of the day, the question for us, especially in this conference, is are our, is our education system, so let me go and think about the Philippines a little bit, is our education system able to build, to nurture these soft skills or psychosocial skills besides inculcating the cognitive skills very well in our students. So I think what we're, we're saying with this study is that, yes, we rebalance front-loading versus uh, schooling versus uh, continuous learning, we need, but we also should include in the list of things that need to be rebalanced is uh, schooling, years of schooling versus real learning and real learning uh, has two aspects. One is the cognitive skills or the technical skills and academic skills. And the other one would be personality, soft skills, 21st century skills, psychosocial skills. Because those are actually the skills that will help students uh, continue learning throughout their life. It's about openness to um, new experience and, s and intellectual stimulation. It's about conscientiousness and so forth. And do our classrooms actually nurture these kinds of skills in the students? Um, I would say we are missing, with respect to cognitive skills, the technical skills, the vocational skills, but we are also not allowing students to grow with respect to the kinds of skills they need uh, in the labor market, such as problem solving, risk taking, openness to uh, to stimulation, openness to inter uh, new experiences. And the question is, how do we do this? Are our teachers trained to support those kinds of skills? Are our classrooms able to nurture those kinds of skills? What I want to show here is that we, we cannot have the same classroom experience as we've had in the past. We need to move our classroom experience to looking at more holistically the kind of human, more holistic definition of human capital. And that more holistic definition of human capital has to include this other kinds of skills, which we've been calling soft, but they are really hard to teach. Soft, yes, but they're actually hard, harder to measure. Soft, but they're harder to nurture and to build, especially in cases where you have greater poverty. I mean, greater poverty probably allows kids more resilience. That maybe that's one of the positive things about hardship is that they can build resilience, but they can also create a lot of fearfulness about risks, and new experiences. And so 
discourage uh, openness to continuous learning. So I hope this is, this is just a, a way of, of thinking about the child or the worker, or the student or the worker. We have been talking so far in this, in this uh, conference about the, the, the ecosystem of innovation and so on. At the end of the day, the real question, I think, is what happens to the, how do we nurture the receptiveness of students and, and workers to all of these disruptive technologies? Give a big hand. It shows your age, uh, Dr. Camacho. I don't think uh, you know my name. I used to be Ascarraga, you know, the, what is recto now? <laughs> so that means you're young. <laughs> Good afternoon to everybody. I would like to share with you my um, reflections on the implications on education and training. I knew that most of the day would be spent on the technologies driving um, fire. So being a professor of computer science, I'll put a little bit more on the mainstreamed AI um, and talk about it, um, um, mainly in relation to human capital development. So I will uh, we'll stay away from all the social aspects of uh, you know, teaching our students about data privacy and all of that. Um, I have color-coded my slides. There is a part one which uh, intersects a bit, uh, a lot with uh, the talk of Dr. Fung, um, which is to prepare students for a predictably uncertain future and some uh, recommendations. Um, and to complement his talk, I will really talk. I will really be um, uh, talking about the Philippine conditions. That means test that Chad, you know, these kinds of things. Part two will be in green. Uh, part one in blue. Part two in green will be about self-regulated collaborative learning, disrupted classrooms. And here I might invite some uh, objections from Dr. King because I'll be talking of intelligent digital tutors who might replace teachers and books in the classrooms. I'm sure you will howl and object to all of those thoughts. But I will argue that they will come regardless. Uh, it's just a matter of when and when things become um, feasible or uh, acceptable. Anyway, so um, part one, the blue slides. Um, this is now the cyber physical world and the first and the industry 4.0. Um, we have already heard about the various technologies, uh, IoT, AI, machine learning, those kinds of things. Um, the way people live and enjoy life, the way we learn, the way we find our life partners, the way we um, engage government, the way we avail of services of government will all be altered and will be altered in a major way. And because all roads lead to the web, we expect new industries, new services, new applications, and all of that would imply new professions. And new professions mean new skills, and uh, the programs that we have for now, which prepare students for pre-industry 4.0, will no longer be, most of them will, may not be suited for Industry 4.0. So the whole premise of my implications for education and training will be about that possible mismatch and probably even displacement of workers who are now, for example, the call center operators. Um, we, we need to note that the cyber infrastructure will connect not just people to people, as we know, social media, but also people to gadgets and sensors. So we can literally uh, connect to our laptop at home. We can connect to our coffee maker. If we come home late, uh, early in the morning, we want our coffee to be ready. We can connect to our coffee maker before we arrive. We can. Uh, this uh, unlock the main door if we want, even when we're in Singapore or in Mexico. We also can connect to a supercomputer in Japan or in Singapore to do our research. All of these are now possible because almost everything, people and non-people, are connected somehow to the same cyber structure. And all, and all these sensors and gadgets can be designed 
to send real-time signals to the cloud. And once they are at the cloud, that can be processed, that can be analyzed, that can be simulated. So we can have such things as um, digital twins, as mentioned earlier this morning, where an entire manu manufacturing plant would have its digital twin in the cloud, and everything can be studied way before something major will happen. So this would be useful for your telcos, your electric, electricity companies, water companies, almost everything can have a digital twin at different scales, and you can foresee and uh, program whatever interventions you'd like to do way before the actual problem arises, okay? So, uh, uh, so just that um, we have all these uh, modern manufacturing plants with all these sensors, etc. Later, I will talk about how that same scenario can happen to schools, where we will have sensors also, and we will have our students and not our objects being monitored by gadgets and sensors, and uh, paint a futuristic scenario, good or bad, that will alter in a major way the education landscape in the Philippines. Okay, so um, we will also talk about a bit more about mainstream AI. AI just being um, this uh, intelligent digital software that have been trained to think like human beings and to talk like us and to understand us and um, in a way uh, do things sometimes even better than us. And most of the time, minus the hangover, minus the, you know, you wake up with a bad mood, you deal with people differently, with these uh, chatbots, they are always courteous and respectful and, and nice to you. <laughs> okay. So, but then, quite naturally, we worry about the displacement of workers, particularly call center operators. We've heard about um, chatbots, for example. Um, they will be there. No more, no more Filipinos. Uh, when, you, when you call Singapore Airlines, Filipino answering, answering there. Actually, now you'll be talking more and more with chatbots, and they have become so effective that I think in some countries they are really considering laws that require companies to say that you are talking to a robot. Okay, it becomes a right of a citizen to know whether you are talking to a human being or to a robot, and there are other people talking now of robots calling you and offering you all kinds of services, uh, and they can deploy this uh, untiringly. Um, in a very massive way, and again, this will alter all kinds of. Um, this is this will alter uh, uh, our lives uh, in 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 at a scale that is not imaginable. Um, so we also say that um, if there's a, this mismatch between pre 4.0 skills and the services that modern companies will be, will be offering and the skills that they need, if that prolongs, then you might have prospective employers not coming to the Philippines, or modern manufacturing plants might leave us and set up elsewhere because we don't have the skills required. So that sets the, the kind of um, uh, scenario for a real serious look at how we produce engineers, uh, computer scientists, etc. Now, the, the usual reaction is to, if, if what we need is data science, let's have a BS in data science, BS in business analytics, etc. Personally, I would prefer not to encourage the mushrooming of these new sexy programs uh, really packaged for the market, and instead just build in flexibility and relevance in the college curricula. I think this is echoing uh, what uh, Singapore is planning to do and is doing. Um, and there are a number of ways that we already know. Um, electives, Chad designs this, uh, uh, that every curriculum would have a generous set of electives. But as I, I'm not sure, are we giving away the papers? The papers that we submitted to you? Are you giving it to them? Oh, okay, so there are some details there about the problems with our elective systems, but just to be fair, even as it is now, our curricula um, mandated or suggested by CHED 
usually would really have a general set of electives. Some are free, some are uh, allied with the, th with the courses. And that is a built-in flexibility in the program. So you don't have to have a fresh new program just to have a slant towards data science, for example. You can take a computer science program and readily, even now, already do uh, data science. And then you just couple it, I mean, complement it with your capstone and your undergraduate thesis, and you're off to go. Um, but we have problems with the elective systems, and again, I won't go into the details of those. And there is one key thing is to focus on one learning outcome. That is to be able to learn new things by yourself and this lifelong learning. Um, I've been pushing for this in computer science. We do this uh, in most universities, but I have been pushing it in La Salle to be very methodical about it. Make sure that students, in the way we teach them from freshman to fourth year, make sure that students are able to new to learn new platforms, new languages, new uh, uh, packages by themselves. And strangely enough, to do that, you will need to focus on the fundamentals. You have to focus on the old so that they can quickly adapt to the new. I don't know if it's counterintuitive. Sometimes people, say, people think automatically that if you want to prepare them for the future, you teach them the new things. But actually, you teach them the old, teach them the proper math, the proper statistics, proper electronics, computing algorithms. And that creates a solid foundation that they will use to be able to adapt to new things. And just have the capstone project to work, to work on and to, uh, to, 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 um, to provide the rest of the skills that they need, maybe in machine learning, in big data, and all that. Now, there has to be a platform for big data applications, and this, I noted, uh, DOST or the ICT may want to have a center, or probably informally a group of uh, people, personal, full-time personnel, whose only job is to gather, curate, gather, pre-process, anonymized data from government, and make this data, push this and promote this, make them available to schools, government office, etc., to use, okay, once properly uh, anonymized. So that we, in the schools, we will have real problems to work on. And real problems that our computer science students can uh, try their computing uh, knowledge, their electrical engineers can try their uh, whatever training they have had, their business people can try their hand there too. Okay, but these, I have to uh, uh, emphasize, have to be real, live, voluminous data from government. And it has to be a habit of government to put it up on the web or somewhere easy for students to access and for teachers to use uh, in the training of our students. Um, and I, I see... Uh, Dr. C.P. David here. Um, we've already started the, the nationwide training of AI among uh, schools all over the country, not just the big universities, but schools in, in, in southern Luzon, in the Visayas, and Mindanao. And to try to get key people to already learn about the new stuff in machine learning, to complement what they already knew in mathematics, in electrical engineering, in computer science. And aside from that, and this is one thing that we still need to do, is to set up a computing platform for big data applications. So my own student, a PhD student in La Salle, La Salle is already not so poor, we don't have this computing platform to do real big data applications. We used to get by with laptops, we do our experiments with laptops, now we cannot do those anymore. The kinds of data, the kinds, the size of the data set, the volume, is just that we really need uh, GPUs and very, very, very um, high performance uh, computing platforms to do that. So my student had to do one year sandwich in Singapore at the National University of Singapore, used the GPU farm there and finished most of his PhD and came back to defend his thesis. And in fact, while, and then we also sent some to Taiwan, while they're on vacation here, they do a remote login, continue with their projects, run their experiments there. That's anyway also still possible. But anyway, we cannot continue like that, you know, depending on our neighbors, we probably, uh, SOS, DOST, uh, 
we probably need that uh, platform here in the Philippines that the entire, uh, at least those who are ready for it, can use to run on big data applications. Um, there were some questions earlier this morning about STEM. And I really, really also thought that we cannot talk of college and engineering and mathematics and big uh, data science and all those without talking of STEM. And um, we, uh, I sent this to Brother Armin because they might feel slighted in depth ed, that I thought really that um, we should encourage a few schools to innovate and to, to offer alternate, uh, alternative, innovative uh, model STEM curricula. And to purposely, and right at the onset, tell them, please deviate from the framework offered by DepEd. And encourage all this experimentation among the big schools, among those who are ready. And maybe in the next five to 10 years, for all of us to look at those practices and share and see what are the best practices and under which conditions would those kinds of curricula work. Okay, I really think there are problems. I was involved somehow with Philippine Science High School. Um, you have the main campus uh, sort of like uh, imagining how it might be for the smaller campuses in Mindanao. How can they teach such an advanced course, etc.? So they end up uh, doing something not as uh, uh, not what they could have done as a main campus of the Philippine Science High School system. Um, there is also this one large. Philippine Science High School, senior high school. I don't think every Philippine Science High School must have its own senior science high. And I don't think the junior, si the junior high school should run the senior high school. So there has to be that, I think, in our STEM. And also, those graduates, the very talented science and math students, must have a special program in the university. They cannot continue in the university waiting for everybody else to catch up with their algebra, catch up with their calculus, and then wait and in the meantime, lose their study habits and lose interest in studying. That has to be done. We've been, I'm an alumnus of Philippine Science, 2014 in our Jubilee year, we were talking about this, that let's have uh, some, uh, a large senior science high school and then do some seamless transition once in the university. And not just for PSHS, it's for many of the talented students coming out of our high school. Tech Voc in the limelight, this is one thing that uh, came out uh, I think Senator Joel Villanueva won because uh, of K-12. <laughs> if there's one bright spot of K-12, it was the TESDA, TechVoc Education, was uh, given serious and a, a, good, uh, a good standing, and it's one good service that people see from government. Okay, and so we have to note that 99.9% .9 of the more than one million who enter senior high school will not be the kinds of students that should be doing research or design in data science, okay? Data, all these industries have all kinds of levels and we have to focus on 99.9% .9 of the one million. That's a lot of people and the key is really tech voc, the way it was designed for Singapore where we blend TESDA and CHED. I really hope there will be more TESDA and CHED uh, and we do it, uh, we do it properly. Um, as it is, we have uh, technicians, when we, we say engineering, they are really technicians. We say accounting, they are really bookkeepers, okay? So we, really our programs must be, if it's technician, it should be technician. You don't ask them to do research if they are technicians. You ask them to work with companies, etc. okay? Now, mainstream AI, I will spend less time. I have less than five minutes. Um, mainstream AI also affects the way we do learning itself. This is, uh, this is where I will invite major reaction from you. Negative, I think. Um, as, vir uh, as humans, we will need to share the cyber world with virtual humans. We need to share the world with our digital creations. It's incredible what we see uh, being presented in conferences where uh, chess playing champions or uh, software can learn to do it in three days now, and with no intervention now from, no data from people anymore. They can learn by themselves. And they start uh, talking to each other in a language that they only understand. 
And there are really these kinds of developments uh, in AI that can be exciting, but at the same time scary. But if we just push the chatbot a bit more, and the Philippines, by the way, is very strong in natural language processing. Huh? We are very strong in this. Um, we can merge the teacher and the book into a single intelligent digital tutor. So your students will learn English from a robot that speaks perfect English, that uh, has, uh, you know, all the science that he's going to teach is already pre-evaluated and correct, okay? Uh, but, and they are patient, never rude, they have neutral accent, correct English, etc. <laughs> and with the knowledge of the learning styles of children. This is part of intelligent tutoring systems, which we have studied since the 80s. So you have there this, uh, it's no longer whether it is possible. It is more of when. And I really suggest uh, the OSD, I don't know, Chad, DepEd, to already commission studies on how soft skills, <laughs> how soft skills will still be taken into account when we have uh, interventions like this digital, uh, inter intelligent digital tutors. But I, can fig I figure it's probably also going to be cheaper. And I mean, these are not uh, toys that they play at home. This will be in schools, okay? So it's for schools to evaluate whether they can afford it, and maybe it's going to be cheaper. Uh, God bless the teachers, the jobs again, and all that. Now, uh, there are also this work on sensors in the classroom. Much like putting sensors in manufacturing plants, put sensors in classrooms, you will know, like I would be able to tell whether you're bored, you're sleepy, etc. And the teacher will be told, Boring, change your pace, change your language, etc. Oh my goodness, is that a signal? Oh. Okay, um, there's the heightened experiences in VR, AR, and IR, in, in uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, immersive reality. You can teach history as a kind of game that the child is part of history, he learn about it. You will see David in Florence up there with your virtual reality. You don't have to see the museums in Europe, it's all there in your in your classroom. But it might also just be a distraction, so we have to be careful about it. Just two more slides. Um, um, there's all these uh, possibilities, like the digital twins, and, but we have to look at it. And it might, for all we know, a niche for the Philippines as a sector that we can promote, uh, like the game industry or what. And finally, learning will be self-regulated and highly collaborative. That's how uh, children are being brought up and so we have to overhaul our training for teachers because that's the world they are growing up in and probably also if we are doing analytics on manufacturing plants we also do analytics on our learning and our learners so we will know in the arm how is their geometry skills in Quezon City how is their English for grade one etc so that's it thank you Uh, good afternoon to all, and of course I would like to first of all thank uh, the organizers. Uh, I see the uh, President, Dr. Reyes of PIDS. Um, we're very honored to join you for this event. Um, this title, of course, is tongue-in-cheek um, because I, we perceived, my husband and I, we perceived this. Uh, there's, of course, a lot of excitement with the Fourth Industrial Revolution, but with the challenges, the opportunities that come in, for us, there's no reason really to, to feel any dread. Uh, as uh, Mr. Zabel de Ayala said, there should be some optimism. So for us, challenges are opportunities, so we face fire, fire with water. Now what is water? But before we go th to that, let me just quote some phrases from the um, papers sent to us as speakers. Workers with less education and fewer skills are likely to be at a disadvantage as the fire progresses. And there is a need to adapt to the changing nature of work by making investments in training people to have both soft skills, as, our, as Dr. King has mentioned, and technical competencies. And among other questions, they raised the following. What critical policy decisions and strategic actions should the country be taking today to get the current 
and future workforce ready for uh, fire. Now, another question would be, what can and should be done so that Filipino workers and the young who are now lagging behind in human capital development are able to catch up and move ahead amidst labor market challenges and opportunities? Now, they send us these questions from the outset, I would like to emphasize that as, I, as we endeavor to answer these questions, we personally take the perspective of the Philippines, especially because we are Filipinos, without losing our view on the global situation, of course. Now, the good thing about being the last speaker is that I actually concur with a lot of what they have said, but I would still like to repeat uh, my key points here because this is a policy uh, meeting, focusing on policy making, the critical choices here for policy makers would be uh, the curriculum content and the depth, so that encompasses, for example, the remarks of Dr. Ascaraga, uh, Dr. King, and our other speakers this morning also. You have the learning program and the materials. When we say learning program, normally people would say the pedagogical program or instructional program or teaching program. I would like to focus on the learning program in anticipation of the years to come with AI. So in the end, the focus will really be on the learners. And then I make the third critical choice, budget optimization. Because there is always the instinct to say, Look, we cannot catch up, we cannot do this, we lack the infrastructure, we lack the budget, we lack so many things. For us, that's not an excuse, that is no reason not to be able to catch up. There are ways to catch up. And what is water, in this case, just to make sure it's not really the real water, I would call this wide-ranging advanced analytics training and education reinforcement. I chose the word reinforcement because when you have high-rise condominiums, for example, if you build only with concrete, then that would not be strong enough. So there has to be a core of steel bars, for example. So you call that reinforced concrete. And just so that our theory is grounded in practice, in what goes on in the real world, in the real classroom, with real people and not just robots, I will, if I have time, just briefly look at our experience in our school. Okay, so why are these choices critical for policymakers? If we have a poor learning program, a poor curriculum or weak curriculum, and much expenses, hundreds of millions of dollars poured into our educational programs, then we would simply have a, sorry, waste of human and material resources. No matter how many high-tech gadgets you buy or equipment for your classrooms, if you have a weak curriculum, you have a weak program, you get nothing or you get very little, negligible outcome. Now, you could have a good curriculum, but if you have a poor learning program, uh, I like the term sticky floor, for example, if you're weighed down by very old, traditional, fashionable trends, where you just simply follow and not go back to basic principles, then no matter how much money, again, that you pour in, hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars, then you would only get pockets of good learner development. Perhaps 1% or perhaps 0.1% of your cohort of learners. Now you can have a good learning program, but you have a poor curriculum, not updated, and again, big budget. You can have selective ability-based learner development. So what has happened in the Philippines, um, no offense meant to alumni of the Philippine Science High School and other elite institutions, we have a few who do very well, who are globally competitive. But what happens to the hundreds of millions of young Filipinos? They are deprived of the opportunity to do well. So what would we like? Of course, 
For our policies, we would like a strategic learning program, a strong, updated learning program based on evidence and based on a, an objective analysis. And so you have a strong curriculum also, also updated, relevant, and minimal expense for education and training so that you can use part of the budget your hundreds of millions of dollars for other endeavors or projects of the government, such as medical care. And with this, with these three, if you make the right policy decisions, then you would be assured of abundance. Not just a few, not just the elite, but you have majority of your young people becoming high caliber human resources for your country. So, let's go back to water now. With fire, with the fourth industrial revolution, how do we prepare them? I'm a school director, so I focus on preparing for basic education, but I also teach graduate school, so this, the string there goes all the way to graduate school and beyond. Why is it wide-ranging? It is extensive in scope, demographical and anthropological distribution, so this covers gender differences, this covers age differences, this covers attitudes, behaviors, preparation, cultural differences, language differences, background differences. So it would be wide ranging because if you focus on only a small part of the population, then the country loses. It is also wide-ranging, extensive, in the sense of disciplines for long-haul training. Disciplines including STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, agriculture, humanities, social sciences, all the disciplines. We expose our young people to all of this. Let them choose and give them the proper training and education. And it is also wide-ranging because we are talking about transnational uh, mobility of our workers, sorry, of our learners. So it is wide ranging, you address all, the whole spectrum, because we could actually have slow learners, we call them challenged learners, but from experience, later on they are able to catch up, given enough time and even given enough training. So just to give you some numbers, this is the one that I was able to confirm. Uh, uh, secondary schools enrollment, we already have a total of 7 million. Now, it is 2018, normally there is an increase, a rapid increase in this population of secondary schools. This is already bigger than the population of Singapore, if I am not mistaken. So you can imagine the wealth of human resources that our country has. Now in this age with a fire, you can imagine the potential for catching up because technology will, be demo will democratize opportunities and therefore mind power now will be the most essential. And that is easiest to catch up on. Common problems, of course, when we talk about development of our learners, if you are addressing the whole spectrum Boosting interest in STEM. This morning, we had several, including uh, Mr. Ayala, Mr. Um, all the other speakers, Wada and so on. And earlier this afternoon, people were talking about the lack of interest of our young people in the STEM courses. Or they enroll in engineering and graduate in home economics. Why? First semester, second semester, they fail in calculus. They fail in physics. They fail in chemistry. They fail in the engineering sciences. Why is that happening? Philippine Science High School students, the elite, taking six years, seven years to complete a five-year course. Something is wrong. Is it just lack of interest? Or is there something wrong in the learning program? So sustaining interest and passing grades throughout the university course, and most important, patching up deficiencies in mathematical preparation. And I agree with Dr. Azgaraga when he mentioned that people always think 
to face something new, you have to come up with a new curriculum, everything new. What he emphasized was the old fundamentals. I share that uh, perspective, train them well in the solid traditional fundamentals, and that will be their springboard to explore anything that is new. So look at the interest here, um, enrollment by discipline. As you see, for a cohort of more than 3 million, how many are interested in the natural sciences? This is from our statistics uh, center in the Philippines. Only around 38,000. As you see, 1% natural sciences. Math and computer sciences, 0%. No, if you do not wish to be overwhelmed and swamped by the fire, definitely you must have a populace who are very much comfortable with the maths, with computer sciences, with engineering sciences, and all these proverbially tough courses. And again, that, that tells us that there is a problem for our foreign guests here. I am just saying that there is a gap between the rich and the poor, and not only in the Philippines, but in many other countries, this gap is widening, even in the UK, in the US. As you see, the, the wealthy would form only a very small percentage, and you have many, many people suffering from poverty. Now, how will you train them for this fire? How will you train them for the workforce? How will you train them so that they will not remain low-wage earners, but high-income people? So it's a serious problem that's wide-ranging. We will address that whole distribution demographically, anthropologically, disciplinal distribution, train them, and see how we can get abundant human resources. I'm sorry. Now, advanced, so we have water, uh, wide ranging, advanced. Sorry, I did not want to cover the screen. So it should be advanced in the sense that with our curriculum, with our learning program, we should connect the education from kindergarten to grade 10, all the way to senior high school, give them strong uh, training, not just in the elite schools, but all public schools, Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, and all the way to college, whether they pursue technical vocational courses, make, give them a strong background, whether they pursue business courses or f start their own businesses, they should have good analytical background, and then all the way beyond to graduate school, professional school, and life as a citizen. That's one A. The second A would be analytics. People have been talking about analytics, uh, so I will not uh, go so much into the details, except that when we talk about a good curriculum nowadays, a strong curriculum, a solid curriculum, it is inevitable that we have to have a curriculum which is strong in physics, chemistry, biology, earth sciences. Why? Maybe Newton's law or maybe the old theories may not be remembered by the students when they graduate. But what is important here? It's the analytical process. It's the thinking. So some countries, advanced countries included, because of the difficulty of physics and chemistry, have made these elective subjects. So they have many young people now not taking physics, not taking chemistry, because once you make it an elective, the instinct would be, I would rather take something else. In the Philippines, I am happy. Of course, I am biased, so please don't believe me. I am a physicist, and therefore I say I, am, I very much agree with the Philippines because it maintains physics, chemistry, biology as required subjects. Now, the only problem is, how do you teach it so that they will not be terrorized? So we also have economics, political science, sociology, anthropology, governance, and so on, they should now be at a higher level, strongly math-infused. Otherwise, you'll be left behind. All of this now can have data science. We can analyze if there is fraud in the elections through statistical signatures. That can be taught even in senior high school. 
humanities and the arts. Can this be math infused? Yes. Sports and kinetics, definitely. And then of course you have computational methods, design and engineering, and as, uh, I think we agree very well on this and the others. Of course the soft skills are there, but if we have to catch up, and not only catch up, but even outpace, if we're lucky, we have to be very, very strong on this. Now the last, the ER, would be education reinforcement, which means that we let our young people go all the way up, not just visual kinesthetic, uh, which means just describing what they see, what they feel, and talk about it, chat about it, give theories left and right, because opinions are born equal in the absence of evidence. Now, for the 21st century, it is very important that we go up not only to the explanatory in terms of verbal, conceptual explanations, but we have to be quantitative mathematical. That's why it has to be infused, mathematics-infused disciplines, wide-ranging STEM, humanities, social sciences, arts, etc. And not just data analytics. You cannot stop at that. Remember, even if you have voluminous data, he could have that data, you could have that data, I could have that data, but we could have different interpretations. So young people should also go all the way, should have an exposure to QM. QM here is quantitative mathematical, not quantum mechanics. It's synthesis, which means they should be trained to get the bigger picture. From the details, inductive, getting the bigger picture. From the bigger picture, going down to the details and having enough predictive power using their maths. So analytics training should be conceptual level, but we don't stop at that. There is a verbal level, but definitely we must be strongly mathematical. Now, because, I, because still we are working with FIRE, another way of spelling out this acronym would be Web Adapted Analytics Training and Education Reinforcement. So that's an option. How do we give our students, our learners in the Philippines, Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, as he mentioned, there are some science high schools which are in very remote areas. What's the quality? of their teachers, are they really qualified? And normally, educational institutions are judged or are, well, evaluated on the strengths of their faculty, what would they have? Then, web adapt, uh, adaptation comes in. There is so much technology now. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology has a wide-ranging offering of courses, mathematics, engineering, and so on. How do we help our young people take advantage of that, even if they are in Basilan? It's possible. So, of course, uh, we started this dynamic learning program. As I said, you take everything that I say with a grain of salt because I would be very, I would not be really objective because we started this to improve the performance of our students in our school. It's not a science high school. We are not selective. We accept grade seven, for grade seven, students coming from mostly public elementary schools, many of them non-readers, many of them coming from socially, uh, economically disadvantaged families, our parents, we have parents of tricyc uh, tricycle drivers, farmers, vendors, laborers, fishermen, they have no good reading materials at home. Is it a dream? Of course it's a dream. Is it realizable? Yes. So we have papers on this. What was our, our design requirements, if it were, this were a, an engineering problem or a, or a business model? Following Ford's Model T, he, he mentioned, sorry, yeah. So it's time's up, so let me just finish this. Large scale enough for state school systems, but individualized enough for each student in any school. It should have best evidence-based features for curriculum and didactics, and so low in cost that effective implementation is possible for any nation. And here we have the four components that you can, uh, well, you can now Google our, uh, our program. These are the pro uh, components, parallel learning groups, simultaneous classes, 
in-school comprehensive portfolio, activity-based learning by doing, and strategic rest. Absolutely no homework, and you have which are non-negotiable. All the features with the stars are non-negotiable. So no homework, no projects at home. We recommend no tutoring outside of school hours. Can they perform? Our performance indicators, I'm very happy to tell you, for example, we have now an alumnus taking his PhD at the Swiss Federal Institute at the High in Switzerland, ranked number one in the world in earth and marine sciences. He was our graduate 2005. And he said, ma'am, when I arrived here, I realized it's very much like the DLP, where they do a lot of writing. We also have one taking a PhD in Dresden, in Germany, Max Planck Institute and other students, of course, doing quite well in the Philippines. Thank you for your attention. We have microphones here. One microphone here. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Philip from the University of San Carlos. I would like to address this question to Victor King. Uh, your presentation is very interesting. You calculated the how much to add the cost, uh, the wage level that would be added to the education. Have you considered the impact of culture on salaries? For instance, first world country like Japan, there is a big difference between the salary of a man and a woman even if it is first world. Women's salary are still very much low compared to men, and yet they're the first world country. So I was just thinking, what is the import of culture into the difference of wage earning? Thank you. Dr. King, respond please. Right, so, so I would interpret the fact that that the composition of the gender wage earnings difference um, indicates that uh, the, the way the labor market rewards human capital and that it rewards human capital differently from men and women as in a way what you what you're saying is it's probably culture or the division sexual division of labor or uh, what happens about uh, what goes on with respect to investments in, in girls, in sons and daughters, um, you know, in the home. The fact that the, what we are calling the uh, coefficients gap is more important than the co covariance gap. The covariance gap being simply the, the returns to the human capital itself. I mean, the, Part of the, the, the gender difference that's due to the, the level of human capital rather than the, the way the human capital is rewarded. The fact that that's the case, right, that the coefficients gap is bigger, is really, I think, due to uh, gender differences in, in, in social roles and family roles. So I would say that that is because of the, what you're calling culture. Uh, also, what we noticed is that the women in the so post-socialist countries uh, tend to have um, tend to have more of the stronger non-cognitive -cogn non because the non-cognitive skills, even though we call it some of the sometimes you call those personality traits, you can develop them. And if you have a, a labor market that actually does not distinguish very much. Uh, with respect uh, between men and women, and actually allow women to take paid work, <clears throat> and are more likely to be employed also than women in other countries, then then those women begin to develop also some of the traits that are really valued by the labor markets. So again, I would say those are two, to me two pieces of evidence that. What you're calling culture is, is important. Right. So, so I would interpret the fact that, that the composition of the gender wage earnings difference um, 
indicates that uh, the, the way the labor market rewards human capital and that it rewards human capital differently for men and women as in a way what you what you're saying is it's probably culture or the division sexual division of labor or uh, what happens about uh, what goes on with respect to investments in, in girls in sons and daughters uh, you know in the home the fact that the what we are calling the uh, coefficients gap is more important than the co covariance gap. The covariance gap being simply the, the returns to the human capital itself. I mean, the, the part of the, the, the gender difference that's due to the, the level of human capital rather than the, the way the human capital is rewarded. The fact that that's the case, right, that the coefficients gap is bigger is really, I think, due to uh, gender differences in, in, in social roles, in family roles. So I would say that that is because of the, what you're calling culture. Uh, also, what we noticed is that the women in the so post-socialist countries uh, tend to have, um, tend to have more of the stronger non-cognitive, non because the non-cognitive skills, even though we call it some of the, sometimes you call those personality traits, you can develop them. And if you have a, a labor market that actually does not distinguish very much uh, with respect, uh, between women, men and women, and actually allow women to take paid work, right, and are more likely to be employed also than women in other countries, then, then those women begin to develop also some of the traits that are really valued by the labor markets. So again, I would say those are, two, to me, two pieces of evidence that what you're calling culture is, is important. Thank you. <coughs> uh, I'm Alberto Felix, uh, I'm a businessman. The uh, really, you know, this is uh, the 4.0. Uh, it's fine, you know. We, 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 all of the speakers that we've been this morning, we're talking about what it's all about. But really, uh, to me, how how do we how what is going to be our response to the future of work and to the future of the economy? And to me, the, the best place or what we should be doing is to restructure our education and training system so that this will really prepare our human resources for the world of work in the future. Or today, it's already the present. Uh, our problem is that our school system is still teaching what they were teaching the way they were teaching and the, and the content that they're teaching still still what was being done 30, 40 years ago. And secondly, the achievement levels of our of our learners, even if they graduate from senior high school, I don't know, the achievement levels are below what a senior high school student should have. And uh, you mentioned that uh, we have 1.1 or 1.2 million in high school. Uh, I mean, graduating from high school, but uh, the cohort is 2.5. So uh, that's more than 50 percent have dropped out already. You know? and even though senior high schools uh, graduates, they're not qualified. Uh, for the world of work. Uh, I know, because I'm an employer. When I hire people, I have to really train them for the job at hand. No? So there's been, as was stated earlier, there has to be better uh, partnership between education and training and, and the employers as to what uh, is really needed, what kind of competency and skills 
how you did in the workplace. Uh, so, we've been working at the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry uh, on trying to bring in uh, dual education and training in senior high school. And uh, we will continue to do so in the same place with the, on the tertiary level. So, but uh, we started here because this is where we will also have a uh, greater need in that area. The college students can, can more or less take care of themselves. Uh, but uh, even then, I hire engineers and they don't know the work in my workplace or in my factory. You know? So I really, I'm already aware of, and, and I know about CBIF and, and what they're doing. They're teaching in a different way. Uh, but today, our education system still talk about lack of classrooms, lack of teachers, uh, inaccurate textbooks. Instead of talking about, okay, how do we apply the new technologies? Like uh, massive online courses, why can't that be offered? everybody. Now, on that side, I did want to ask uh, Mr. Sobel this morning, why can't we have free access to the internet? <laughs> <laughs> you would have to change, they would have to change their business model. They can give free access to the internet, but they make their money from the advertising, etc., etc. Uh, but that has to be a change of thinking on their part. Because right now, they're making a lot of money from uh, subscription to mobile phones and to and to uh, getting an internet connection. But even an internet connection is one of the slowest in the region and in the world. Thank you. The thoughts from our uh, speakers, Dr. Ascaran. He said uh, the need to reorient, to restructure the educational system. And the very example of uh, Dr. Bernardo very dynamic curriculum. Any thoughts from, from what our uh, group sent the from the business center? Well, oh, I don't have to stand up. Uh, yes, definitely we need to make the curriculum relevant, but always with some caution. I think I just quickly, very briefly mentioned that. Yes, we would like to prepare them for the, for the workforce, but if it would be the industry that would dictate what we should take up in the curriculum, that would also be quite dangerous. Because then, the students might not be equipped for the technology that will be for the future, beyond what industry knows at present. So in the end, it should really be a balance from the whole chain. Which knowledge base we have at the moment that would still be usable even 100 years from now. So for example, the, the classic example there is vacuum tube technology shifting to our semiconductors. Semiconductors came about because of quantum mechanics. But quantum mechanics is learned in the schools and in the universities. Lasers, for example, with all their applications. Computer science. Computer scientists ask them, what should the students be strong in? They would always invariably say mathematics. They should be strong in that. But that is traditional curriculum. So it should be a balance. Can I, can I add a comment to that? Uh, yes, yes, yeah, Dr. Can I add a response to that? So, so although the context in Singapore and Philippines is quite different, uh, I think there is one uh, strong similarity which is education systems are incredibly difficult to change. <laughs> incredibly difficult. I was in a room with a, a number of principals and educators and I asked them, you know, how many of your students uh, actually do not have a passion for learning? You know, uh, and a lot of them put up their hands. Because, you know, it's, it takes a long time to change the system. So, the approach we have taken is we're trying to change and move the system and we're facing the same problem, moving the system, but we augment it. So specifically to your question, how do we help high school graduates, polytechnic graduates get in the workforce and deliver the skills, we do top-up programs. 
So instead of thinking about changing the system, uh, we do top-up programs. So we have a program called Earn and Learn program. The student starts working with an employer, but goes back to school once a week. And over a period of 18 months, we get a, a specialist diploma in a certain area that's aligned with what the employer is looking for. Another program that we have started very recently, and I think that's something that has potential to be uh, you know, adopted here in, in the Philippines. We're working with a McKinsey subsidiary called Generation, and we have started what we call Work Learn Boot Camp. It's an eight week to 12 week long program. They take uh, students coming in from high school, from all techniques, even degree holders, and they train them to specific skills that are required by the companies. So they've interviewed companies, what are the skills you need? We'll train these individuals with the skill sets, in addition to that, uh, they, they do upfront training on mindsets of the, on the students so that they're prepared for the workplace. Uh, and then as employers, you could then interview and choose, from, you know, and choose to recruit those students. And they roll out this program in 18 different countries, including um, you know, uh, middle-income countries, uh, developed nations, uh, developing countries, and so on. So that's something that I think has potential where you do top-ups to bridge the gap between what is produced by the education system and what the industry needs. And that can be very responsive. We started a pilot in this in the area of digital marketing. Because digital marketing is a very hot skill. Even the ICT graduates coming out from polytechnics and degree programs do not have the skills employees are looking for. So we're doing these pop-up programs. Uh, if you're interested to find out more, I can, I can share with you after the uh, session. Thanks, Dr. Fung. We have uh, seven minutes. The future of work and to the future of the economy. And to me, the, the best place or what we should be doing is to restructure our education and training system so that this will really prepare our human resources for the world of work in the future. Or today, it's already the present. Uh, our problem is that our school system is still teaching what they were teaching the way they were teaching and the, and the content that they're teaching still still what was being done 30, 40 years ago. And secondly, the achievement levels of our, of our learners, even if they graduate from senior high school, I don't know, the achievement levels are below what a senior high school student should have. And uh, you mentioned that uh, we have 1.1 or 1.2 million in high school. Uh, I mean, graduating from high school, but uh, the cohort is 2.5. So uh, that's more than 50% have dropped out already, you know. And even though senior high school uh, graduates, they're not qualified. Uh, for the world of work. Uh, I know, because I'm an employer. So when I hire people, I have to really train them for the job at hand. No? So there's been, as was stated earlier, there has to be better uh, partnership between education and training and, and the employers as to what uh, is really needed, what kind of competencies and skills are needed in the workplace. Uh, so, we've been working at the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry uh, on trying to bring in uh, dual education and training in senior high school. And uh, we will continue to do so in the, in the same place with the, on the tertiary level. Uh, so, but uh, we started here because this is where we will also have, uh, there's a greater need in that area. The college students can, can more or less take care of themselves. Uh, but uh, even then, I hire engineers and they don't know the work in my workplace or in my factory. You know? So I really, I'm already aware of, and, and I know about system still talking about lack of classrooms, lack of teachers, 
uh, inaccurate textbooks instead of talking about, okay, how do we apply the new technologies? Like uh, massive online courses, why can't that be offered to everybody? Now, on that side, I didn't want to ask uh, Mr. Sobel this morning, why can't we have free access to the internet? <laughs> you would have to change, they would have to change their business model. They can give free access to the internet, but they make their money from the advertising, etc., etc. Uh, but that has to be a change of thinking on their part. Because right now, they're making a lot of money from uh, subscription to mobile phones and to, and to uh, getting an internet connection. But even an internet connection is one of the slowest in the region and in the world. Thank you. Any thoughts from our uh, speakers? Dr. Ascarag, you said uh, the need to reorient, to restructure the educational system. Uh, the very example of uh, Dr. Bernido, a very dynamic curriculum. Any thoughts from, from what our uh, representative from the business sector has said? Well, oh, I don't have to stand up. Uh, yes, definitely we need to make the curriculum relevant but always with some caution. I think I just quickly, very briefly mentioned that. Yes, we would like to prepare them from the, for the workforce, but if it would be the industry that would dictate what we should take up in the curriculum, that would also be quite dangerous. Because then the students might not be equipped for the technology that will be for the future, beyond what industry knows at present. So in the end, it should really be a balance from the whole chain, which knowledge base we have at the moment that would still be usable even 100 years from now. So for example, the, the classic example there is vacuum tube technology shifting to our semiconductors. Semiconductors came about because of quantum mechanics, but quantum mechanics is learned in the schools and in the universities. Lasers, for example, with all their applications. Computer science. Computer scientists ask them, what should the students be strong in? They would always invariably say mathematics. They should be strong in that. But that is traditional curriculum. So it should be a balance. Can I, can I add a comment to that? Uh, uh, yes, yes, yeah, Dr. Can Fung. I get a response to that? So, so although the context in Singapore and Philippines is quite different. Uh, I think there is one uh, strong similarity, which is education systems are incredibly difficult to change. Incredibly difficult. I was in a room with a, a number of principals and educators and I asked them, you know, how many of your students uh, actually do not have a passion for learning? You know, uh, and a lot of them put up their hands because, you know, it's, it takes a long time to change the system. So the approach we have taken is we're trying to change and move the system and we're facing the same problem, moving the system, but we augment it. So specifically to your question, how do we help high school graduates, polytechnic graduates get in the workforce and deliver the skills, we do top-up programs. So instead of thinking about changing the system, uh, we do top-up programs. So we have a program called Earn and Learn program. The student starts working with an employer but goes back to school once a week. And over a period of 18 months, would get a, a specialist diploma in a certain area that's aligned with what the employer is looking for. Another program that we have started very recently, and I think that's something that has potential to be uh, you know, adopted here in, th in the Philippines. We're working with a McKinsey subsidiary called Generation, and we have started what we call Work Learn Boot Camp. It's an eight week to 12 week long program they take uh, students coming in from high school, from polytechnics, even degree holders, and they train them to specific skills that are required by the companies. So they'll interview the companies, what are the skills you need? We'll train these individuals with the skill sets. In addition to that, uh, they, they do upfront training on mindsets of the, on the students so that they are prepared for the workplace. 
Uh, and then as employers, you could then interview and choose, to, and choose to recruit those students. And they've rolled out this program in 18 different countries, including um, you know, uh, middle-income countries, uh, developed nations, uh, developing countries, and so on. So that's something that I think has potential where you do top-ups to bridge the gap between what is produced by education system and what the industry needs. And that can be very responsive. We started a pilot in this in the area of digital marketing. Because digital marketing is a very hot skill even the ICT graduates coming out from polytechnics and degree programs do not have the skills that employers are looking for. So we're doing these top-up programs. Uh, if you're interested to find out more, I can, I can share with you after the uh, session. Thanks, Dr. Feng. We have... Uh... Um, one of the problems initially in my very dedicated part is that we added two years more to school. I'm very interested in how you handle that in CBI. Can I ask another question? <laughs> Second question is, how do you respond to the question, perhaps your phenomenal outcomes, which I'm aware of, is due to the Bernardo effect? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, before we, we call Dr. Bernardo or can you have the last question? Yes, please. Uh, hi, I'm from APEC Business Advisory Council, Philippines. I'm addressing this question to Dr. Ascarga, and if Mr. Fong also has thoughts, you can chime in. Yeah. Um, we're talking. Uh, we've mentioned about the the fundamentals that we we want our students to have, like the STEM subjects, data science, analytics. And we are discussing how it's imperative for us to like, you know, have the students to have the skills right now. But I would like to get your thoughts on how uh, we should develop our educators so that it's effectively um, <laughs> transmitted to the students and we're hoping to develop for the future. Yeah. Dr. Brady. So for, for the first question of Dr. Fabelia, um, with our program, the students achieve a high level of maturity and content and skills mastery, both soft and uh, cognitive skills, by grade 10. So when we were mandated by law to also offer grade 11 and grade 12 for schools, we used this as a springboard for them for to do real-world research. Uh, our goal now is with uh, data accessible, we don't have to wait for the DOST, there are so much data available now. You have data from the Hubble telescope, you have data from uh, particle accelerators, you have data on genes, on proteins, open access, so, and of course also politics, election results and so on. So our goal is the STEM strand would be able to do data analytics on data connected with STEM, humanities and social sciences, Strand High School could do data analytics uh, on available data on uh, the country's uh, demographics, electoral returns, and so on, weather prediction, and so on. And also because Bohol is a world biodiversity hotspot, it's considered by some to be the center of the center of world's biodiversity, especially in, uh, say, mollusks and so on. So we have also started some research work on diversity, doing some mathematical modeling also of shell structure, for example. And this October 5-6, we are fortunate because we have two guest scientists interested in our DLP also, the way we handle the DLP. They are conducting, we are conducting a workshop on computational biology, big data and biology, if you can access proteins and genes and so on. How do you do data analytics on this big data? artificial intelligence also, and basic computer programming using Python, which is a language that researchers also use. So senior high school, we will be working on that so that we could bridge the gap to immediate real world research. Thank you. And if it's connected to us, the phenomenon, well, the DLP is already being applied in many schools, in Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, and so we're not there. Clearly, we cannot uh, bilocate, trilocate, and so on. And some schools are also uh, doing very well. Uh, some schools have five passing UPCAT before, and now they're having 31, 32 passers, for example. Then the question, how do we educate the... Dr. 
Yeah. Um, first of all, I just noticed that um, in Dr. Bernita's presentation, they really cut the the teachers' uh, lectures and all that by like at most 20, 30 percent. So that's the spirit of intelligent digital tutors. So give it to the, <laughs> to other people. No, but also the problem-based learning, the active learning that really happens when you give them actual problems to work on. And everything that they need, the math, the physics, after you give them the fundamentals, they will have to learn on their own. That's why it has to be connected to that learning outcome where they're able to learn new things by themselves. And you basically you need to have the infrastructure, some teachers to guide them, to choose the, the problem at the right level, ask the right questions and guide them as they go to the And also to be studied well. Now we also have this uh, training. I think there's also that portion where you cannot start from nothing. So there has to be this uh, retraining of some of our... Um, hi, I'm Jeannie from APEC Business Advisory Council Philippines. I'm addressing this question to Dr. Ascarga. And if Mr. Fong also has thoughts, he can chime in. Um, we're talking, uh, we've mentioned about the the fundamentals that we we want our students to have, like the STEM subjects, data science, analytics, and we are discussing how it's imperative for us to like, you know, have the students to have these skills right now. But I would like to get your thoughts on how uh, we should develop our educators so that it's effectively um, transmitted to the students that we're hoping to develop for the future. Dr. Brady. So for, for the first question of Dr. Fabella, um, with our program, the students achieved a high level of maturity and content and skills mastery, both soft and uh, cognitive skills, by grade 10. So when we were mandated by law to also offer grade 11 and grade 12 for schools, we used this as a springboard for them for, to do real-world research. Uh, our goal now is with uh, data accessible. We don't have to wait for the DOST. There are so much data available now. You have data from the Hubble telescope. You have data from uh, particle accelerators. You have data on genes, on proteins, open access. So, and of course, also politics, election results, and so on. So our goal is the STEM strand would be able to do data analytics on data connected with STEM, humanities and social sciences, Strand High School could do data analytics uh, on available data on uh, the country's uh, demographics, electoral returns, and so on, weather prediction, and so on. And also because Bohol is a world biodiversity hotspot, it's considered by some to be the center of the center of world's biodiversity, especially in, uh, say, mollusk and so on. So we have also started some research work on diversity, doing some mathematical modeling also of shell structure, for example. And this October 5, 6, we are fortunate because we have two guest scientists interested in our DLP, also the way we handle the DLP. They are conducting, we are conducting a workshop on computational biology, big data and biology, if you can access proteins and genes and so on. How do you do data analytics on this big data? artificial intelligence also, and basic computer programming using Python, which is a language that researchers also use. So senior high school, we will be working on that so that we could bridge the gap to immediate real world research. Thank you. And if it's connected to us, the phenomenon, well, the DLP is already being applied in many schools, Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, and so we're not there. Clearly, we cannot uh, bilocate, trilocate, and so on. And some schools are also uh, doing very well. Uh, some schools have five passing UPCAT before, and now they're having 31, 32 passers, for example. And the question, how do we educate the Dr. Ascaraga and Dr. Fung? Yeah. Um, first of all, I just noticed that um, in Dr. Bernida's presentation, they really cut the the teachers' uh, lectures and all that by like at most 20, 30 percent. So that's the spirit of intelligent digital tutors. You give it to, <laughs> to other people. No, but also the problem-based learning, the active learning that really happens when you give them actual problems to work on. 
and everything that they need, the math, the physics, after you give them the fundamentals, they will have to learn on their own. That's why it has to be connected to that learning outcome where they're able to learn new things by themselves. And you basically will need to have the infrastructure, some teachers to guide them, to choose the, the problem at the right level, ask the right questions and guide them as they produce the results, and also to discuss the results. Now we also have this uh, training. I think there's also that portion where we cannot start from nothing, so there has to be this uh, retraining of some of our computer science faculty. But I also would like to, to emphasize that we don't want programs that are there for the market. They, because we are private-led, as you know, the education in the Philippines, so there's that temptation to put it up for the name to attract students, but actually it's quite hollow inside. So uh, that's where we really have to build the, the expertise. As you say, it's worrisome. So that has to be done. By, I mean, it's computer science. We don't have rivalries. Huh? We help each other. We have conferences among ourselves. We, we help each other's doctoral programs, for example. Many things. Our last remark from Dr. Fung in reaction to the question. Yeah, I think it's, uh, again, uh, you hit the uh, nail on the head, it's another very difficult problem about changing mindsets. Uh, so I think a lot of this is a continued discussion and discourse about the importance of uh, uh, you know, addressing these educational issues. Uh, but in, in the Singapore context, uh, we have continuing education, uh, professional development for our teachers. Uh, but in addition to that, we now have education and career guidance counsellors that attach to each of the schools. Uh, and they would offer some additional support and additional uh, class time with students to uh, infuse some of these skills-based, industry-based knowledge uh, and perspectives with the students. So that augments what the teachers uh, will bring to the picture. Uh, we also certify, we train and certify adult educators as well. So those adult educators that de deliver government-funded programs have to go through pedagogical training, have to go through facilitation training, um, which includes the use of electronic resources and how to uh, uh, make the instruction more problem-based and more uh, industry relevant. So we address that in different parts of the chain as well. So our timekeepers